243. And this will be our offertory hymn. Let's all stand together. And Shannon and Anthony, if you would, when it's time, would you come forward and receive our offer? 243.
Well, I've got one question for you this morning. How many of you are bound for the promised land? Say amen. Amen. Woo, man. Thank you, choir. Kind of got me started here this morning. Now, I'm going to heat this place up a little bit. Is that all right with you all? I thought about coming in and turning the thermostat up on about 98. <laughs> and that's because of what I'm preaching on this morning. They give you a little better feeling about what I'm going to be talking about this morning. So you might want to take a guess. But here, just in a few moments, we're going to go to one of the most important passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be in verse 31 through verse 46. And I believe that this passage of Scripture needs to be at the heart. Let me say it again. I believe this passage of Scripture needs to be at the heart of this church. Won't you say it with me? I believe this passage of Scripture needs to be at the heart of this church. Now, there's a reason that I said that, and that's because this is the last, the last parable that Jesus would teach on before he would be going and facing the cross. Here in the book of Matthew, it's the last one. He's been with his disciples now in, verse, in chapter 24 through chapter 25, and we're coming to the end of chapter 25. We're seeing something that is so important, and it's called the final judgment. Now, I find it amazing when I read this scripture that uh, Jesus waited till right before he was going to the cross to share with the disciples one of his most important parables in the way it's being written. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And there is a passage of Scripture here in the book of Revelation. I'll let you sit down before we read that one. That goes along with this, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that also. Uh, Pray for me today. I've been struggling all week. Uh, Ended up in the first part of the week with a strep throat. Uh, Got over that, feeling pretty good, and my sinuses got infected, and one thing and another. The devil didn't want me to be here today, I'm going to tell you. He didn't want me to bring this message to this church. And I got up this morning, and I said, I'm going to bring that message unless you just knock me plumb down. I'm going to be in that church this morning and tonight. And so I'm here, thank God. And you pray for me, and I believe I'll be better after I preach this. Because the devil's probably going to be afraid of me after I preach this. And I hope it is, because I'm not afraid of him. So beginning in verse 31, here we go. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will be separate people, one from another, separating people one from another, as a shepherd, I love this part, separates the sheep from the goats. And my question to you this morning is, are you a sheep or are you a goat? Turn to your neighbor there and say, are you a sheep or are you a goat? Well, that pretty much settled that, didn't it? Now, we don't want no fighting going on. You understand that, don't you? Because somebody's called you no goat. But he's going to separate the sheep and and the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right hand. But the goats, he's going to put them on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. I like that. But this next part now is one that's strange because watch how he applied this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Bible tells us there's going to be a great separation. A great separation. Now, I don't know about you, but I know where I'm going this morning. I'm, I'm not a goat. I may look like an old goat, but I'm not a goat. I'm a sheep, and I'm in the Lord's pasture, and he's my great shepherd, and he's been ministering me now for a long time and taking care of me. And I pray if you're not in that family that before this service is over with, you'll come down that aisle and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Because there's coming a day. It's called the judgment day. And it's so important. We're going to look at it this morning, and you're going to say, I, didn't, I never did understand that, but now I do. And I don't want to wait any longer. So right now, I want you to bow your heads, and, and I want you to pray if you're lost here this morning that God will give you the conviction you need in your heart and the boldness you need to come down that aisle and give your heart to Jesus Christ. I pray if you're here this morning that you'll lift up those in prayer that you may know that are lost and that you'll pray and thank God right now for where you stand in your relationship to Jesus Christ. Father, we, we have so much to be thankful for. I praise your holy name that I'm able to be here this morning. You are the great physician and all healing comes through you. And you made a promise to me in the book of Psalms that you'd heal your servant. And I claim that this morning. And Father, also I want you in the power of the Holy Spirit to be the greatest part of this service because Lord, I probably can't even do this justice to the way that you would do it in the way that you would say it. But Lord, nevertheless, I'm your servant and I'm going to do my best. So your anointing on high is needed and we need to open our ears and our eyes and our hearts and listen to what this word says in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now I do find this amazing. Here's why I find it so quite amazing. It's because I can go back to where we started in the first four parables I preached about. And I've been here with you now for about four services. And we started preaching about the coming of the Son of Man. And Jesus was, the disciples asked him, Lord, uh, when is that time coming? And uh, he said, immediately after the tribulation, the days the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. That's how he started out, that part. And then he talked about the fig tree and how the fig tree is a great lesson. And the Lord said, you know that things are coming near when this fig tree is blooming. But he also said that nobody knows the days or the hour. And he said, but concerning that day and that hour, nobody knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, nor the Father, for we were in, like in the days of Noah. And we talked about that things are just going to be normal when all of this happens. And then I talked about these, the parable of the ten virgins and how they, they need to be prepared and they weren't prepared. Don't you find it strange that Jesus 
He's hammering down on these apostles, these disciples, and the people that he's speaking to that you've got to be prepared. If you're not prepared, you're going to come before me in the judgment. I'm going to be sitting on the throne of God, and it's my job to judge you. I kind of get a feeling that Jesus is not looking forward to judging people. He wants you to be his brother, to be his sister. That's what he wants. Then he talked about the parable of the talents before we got here. And he wanted us to be faithful in how that, that we took care of his ownership and what was his. And the Bible says that, that God owns the whole world and the cattle on a thousand hills, and he has you and I. And so when I look at this, I'm amazed because now he says, I'm going to give you what's going to happen after all of this. Now, I want you to understand the importance of it. But then I can go. Now, watch this. I can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, and down in verse 11. And I'll read this for you this morning because it's a very important scripture. And it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them and I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open then another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done and the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged each of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Are you getting warm now? Now, I want you to see this importance of this scripture. It is so important because there's a, there's a great division here given in love with God's heart toward all creation. We need God to reveal to us the realities of what we're going to face. You know, if I had information to tell you that you weren't going to live another day and I didn't share that information with you and you found out I knew it, would you be mad at me? Of course you would. Of course you would. But on me, when I, when I look at this, I see so many people say, I, I don't even believe hell exists. But let me tell you something about hell. It's honest. Hell is honest. Hell never has to be our, our lasting home. Did you hear that? God made a way. And Jesus said more about hell than just about anybody did. You know that? I mean, I go through the scripture and, and I see where, where Jesus in this scripture alone talks about hell six times. Luke only talked about hell once. In the book of James, hell was only mentioned one time. But Jesus is the one that mentioned this, folks, not me. Jesus is the one that showed us. And, and the Bible here is, is very strange because he's talking about there's going to be a final judgment. Now, I, I read about something not too long ago that really shocked me because I'm always studying about Israel and, and, and I love when I went to Israel. I just fell in love with Israel and, and I went back and did a lot of research. And when I'm preaching a scripture like this, I like to know the details. And it was said that there's a garbage dump outside the wall of Jerusalem during the days of Herod. And they would take the garbage in, and it's, it's close to a valley of Gehenna, it's called. And they would throw all the garbage in there and the lions, the lions would come in at night and they'd help to clean up the garbage. They would eat the residue. And it was said that they made a decision that when a man had committed a crime, that, and he said, well, are you guilty or not guilty? And he said, I'm not guilty. They'd say, well, we're going to see if you're not guilty. They would, they would tie him up and throw him over the wall and hang him over the wall till morning. And if the lions didn't need him, he wasn't guilty. 
I probably would say there wasn't too many of them that wasn't guilty. They would eat them. There was a judgment. There was a separation. There's a great division here we're looking at. And we're, we're looking at goats and sheep. And, and this is what I, I love about this story because goats are people who claim to be saved but are not. Most people today that I would say is goats, you know, or they're probably caught up in a false religion. Or they're just too stubborn to accept the fact that the Bible is real, that Jesus is God's Son, and that sin is a curse upon you, and you need to be delivered from it. And they argue these points all the time, but the Bible is very clear, and Jesus is being very clear in this parable in the way that he's showing it. Because, see, in Palestine, not like here, the sheep and goats work together. You've been watching Ray Vanderlyn. We see a sheep, they call fatty tail sheep usually. They're pretty big in the back portion. And then the goats are along with them, all kinds of different, different goats. So the sheep and the goats feed together. They sleep together. They walk together. But there's a big difference between sheep and goats. I, I work with sheep. I wouldn't give you a nickel for a goat. You get that? And it's kind of funny because I watch sheep, and sheep are always bowing their head to eat. But you put a goat out in the field, and that goat's looking around everywhere. Isn't that funny? But sheep are always bowing their head down to the ground to eat. And, and sometimes, you know, I look at sheep, and sheep always, the sheep's tail's always down. But a goat's tail's always up. I'll let you figure that one out. So I don't really understand everything I know about it, but I do know this, that the sheep is a loving animal. It's a precious animal. And Jesus is called the Lamb of God. But now, when I think about a goat, there's a Greek goddess called Pan. And he has feet when you see a picture of him, and his feet are goat. Now, I've been to Israel, and I've been by the Bain of Springs. And I do know there's a place there at the Bain of Springs. There's a, there's a, there's a mountain there, and that mountain is, is, is one that where Jesus said, Here upon this, uh, this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the reason that was said, there's a cave there, they say, and they called it the depth of hell in that cave. And there was a goddess there called Pan. And he had the feet of goat. So it's symbolic in any way you look at it. That if you're a goat, you're in a relationship with hell and the devil. But if you're a sheep, you're in a relationship with a good shepherd. So this morning when we look at this scripture, we start to see that hell is real. Notice that he asks no questions. He requested no evidence in the scripture. He just said, you're either a sheep or you're a goat. And he went on to say what's going to happen to the goat, the goats, and what's going to happen to the sheep. And so hell is real. Hell is honest. No one will be in hell by mistake. No one will be in hell unless they honestly belong in hell. Man, let me say, man goes to hell by choice. By choice. It's your choice. And if you make that choice this morning and you don't make the right choice, then you're going to be in a place you're not going to be welcome in when you get there. And a lot of people say, well, we'll be in hell and, and the devil's going to torment us the whole time we're there. No, he's not going to torment you. He's going to be in torments with you. He's going to be the one that's going to be tormented. But who wants to spend all their life in a place throughout all eternity? Two eternities. There's eternity of hell and there's eternity of heaven. And so, you know, when I look at this, man goes to hell by choice and there are no exit signs in hell. Nowhere will you ever see an exit sign in hell. But the devil's going to be there with you. And who wants to be in hell with a creature that has caused me so much pain, so much sorrow all of my life, 
and go to hell and be tortured along beside him when God did not create you to be in hell. God created heaven for you and for me. And so when I read the scripture, I start looking at evidence. How do we know there's evidence in our life that we're a sheep? Jesus made it so clear. Now, I want to make this very clear to you this morning, and I want you to get it, okay? Because I'm not talking about a works religion that I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you ministered unto me. I was cold and you gave me your coat. I can go on and on and on. Now, you're not going to get to heaven because you're doing good works. That's not what this scripture is talking about. What this scripture is talking about, my friends, is that, that there's evidence in your life when you're saved that you have a love of Christ that wants to minister and do this out of your heart, out of your life as the ministry of God. In other words, when you are saved, you ought to have some compassion. Amen? Amen? Amen. The church ought to be the most compassionate place in all the world. But I got to tell you, I've been in a few churches that wasn't compassionate. I've been around some Christians. I don't know. They baptized deal pickle juice or what. They didn't have any compassion. They didn't have any love. They didn't want to do anything for anybody except just warm a pew. Yes, God is saying, and what Jesus is saying here, he's describing our life. What is your life like as a Christian? You know, are, are you going to be over here, and this is my right side, I want to come to the right, okay? Because that's the left side. Y'all right side. If I turned around, y'all be the right side. Nevertheless, God is saying, I'm going to know the difference because of the way you're living your life. Have you got compassion? Have you got evidence? The Apostle Paul said when he was ministering all the time, he, he, he'd been beaten with rods. He'd been thrown in jail, almost died in shipwrecks. And he went through all of that. And he says, I bury my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What kind of marks do we bear in our body of the Lord Jesus? That the world knows who I am and the world cares. Do you realize there are two eternal destinations that awaits all of us? But when I read the scripture, most Christians don't realize that 27% of the Bible is prophecy. Prophecy related verses. But in most pulpits today, only about 2% of the sermons will be prophetic sermons. You know why preachers don't want to preach prophecy? You know why preachers don't want to preach on hell? Because you don't want to hear it. Now, I don't really care. That's just the way I am. I don't care whether you want to hear about hell or whether you want to hear about all the love and in heaven, everything about heaven. But hell's a reality. That's a destination. I love you with a compassion that I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to be in heaven. When I get there, I want to see your smiling face. I want to be able to wrap my arms around you and say, Woo, we finally made it. Hallelujah. Amen. You know. But I look at the world we're living in and it makes me sick. Only 15% of the world believe in the core beliefs of the Bible. That means only 15% of believers in the Bible. 82% of the world believes that the world will not come to an end. And only 18 agree that the world could end as we know it. But it's funny to me because not only do I, I go to the book of Matthew that talks about everything that's happening in the world, and Jesus set the stage and he told us, he said, look around. Look around the scripture. He said, look around you. He said, well, when the end comes, the, the apostle will know. He said, well, there'll be wars, rumors of wars. But all we've had is war. There'll be pestilence. You know, disease, pestilence. I, I put COVID right in the middle of that, won't you? 
You know, we've had that, haven't we? I mean, I've had it. Most of you had it. If you hadn't, you got a perfect body almost. You know, perfect immunity. There'd be famine and hungry. You know, there's a big part of the world right now, and if it gets any worse, we're going to have a hard time feeding our families. Are you with me? You ain't fell asleep, have you? All right, I want you to understand. I'll go turn the thermostat up if you start going to sleep on me. People today are uncomfortable hearing preachers preach about the rapture, about tribulation, about the end of times. It makes them uncomfortable that they say preaching about prophecy will not grow churches who only want to survive and never end. See, it might be a few preachers out there say, I, I don't want to see an end because this is my job. I can make my money. Money ain't a principle to me. The Word of God is my principle. And I'll stand, I'll stand on the Word of God, the Word of God when all else fails. And I'll believe it. If people are uncomfortable today hearing preachers preach about the rapture, they ought to get saved. They ought to get saved. What is obvious to every one of these stories is that when we die or when Jesus comes back, whichever comes first in your life, I don't know which one's going to come first in your life, all of us will be divided between two destinations. I want to say that again. Every individual ever created will stand before God at the judgment. The book of Matthew tells us in two chapters. The book of Revelation tells us in several chapters. For some of us, heaven will be our destination. Whew, man, am I glad I know where I'm going. A place where people will experience unhindered enjoyment. Several times through these scriptures in these places, Jesus talks about being in the joy of the Lord and the blessings of God. You know, I, I get excited when I think about that. For some, heaven will be that destination, a place where people will experience the Father's joy and the Father's love. Matthew 25, 34, we'll enter our kingdom Filled with delight in limitless joy. You got that? And everlasting satisfaction. How long has it been since you had limitless joy, Luke? How long has it been since you had everlasting satisfaction, Luther? How long has it been? I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm not going to speed it up, do something stupid to myself, because I know that it to be a proper time. The Bible says that we were once born and then death comes after that. It's a beautiful imagery. We've all seen over these stories. I go back and I look at the blessed slave in chapter 24, verse 45. I go to the wedding feast and I see how beautiful the wedding feast was and what Jesus said to those at the wedding feast, come on in. It dying. Come on in. And he slammed the door shut and said, you weren't prepared. I could tell where you lived your life. You really wasn't prepared and you didn't believe, basically. And, and we see the master and we turned over his, his property to him, how they reacted. And, you know, when I look at the, the parabolic elements of the shepherd and the sheep and the goats and the process of sorting it's like a apocalyptic describing or prophesying complete destruction of the world. Until the day of judgment, this real event is going to happen in the future of the church and of the world. I've heard people say war is hell. I've heard people say to me, I, I, I don't went through hell in, in my suffering and in the tragedy. And we've all said, time said, you know, it is. Sometimes being in this earth and being on this earth, it, 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 it's just like hell we're going through with what we're going through with. And we find that sometimes there's no way out. But when you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you know you're one of his sheep, you claim all the promises of God and you know that God is going to deliver you. If he don't deliver you from a disease in this world, think about the other world you're going to be going to. You're going to have a new body, no pain, no suffering. 
all joy and fulfillment throughout all eternity. We'll be there as servants with God. I don't know what he's going to be having us doing, but you know what? I think I like my job when I get there. It helps us to understand how the judgment will be carried out when we read this scripture. Oh, how we, we should keep watch as Christians on the events of this world and, and things that are happening. I go back into the scripture and I look at this passage again. It provides a, a clear explanation of how we are to be ready, not just ready, but on alert. On alert, waiting for the Messiah's return. And I'm, I, I'm just so amazed when I, when I see people that, that live their lives. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell the sheep from the goats. Do you know that? You know, we have sheep, and I've never seen a sheep have horns, but goats have horns. You know that? Goats have horns. And so I'm, I'm trying to give you an image here of how we see this separation. And, and when Jesus said, if you're not a sheep, depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. There in verse chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus speaking about a total separation from the Father's love. Hell is not a place where the devil torment sinners. Hell is a place where he's going to be tormented alongside of you. But it's a polar opposite in a sense when you look at the difference between heaven and hell. We need to consider the imagery that Jesus uses for the fate of an unbeliever. He says in chapter 24 that I preached on in verse 51, cut him to pieces weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, eternal fire, and worst of all, hell is a place of never-ending suffering, eternal. You know, and I, I want to say something before I even close this morning. It's very important for you to recognize. I want to bring all of this back to what Jesus says and what Jesus did to deliver you from hell. Jesus don't want you in hell. Jesus knows hell exists. You believe in Jesus? Say amen. amen. Do you believe that Jesus would lie? No. No. You believe that Jesus is, he knows all? Yes. Okay. Jesus knows hell exists. Jesus, now watch this. Jesus took on hell for us. Lost boy or girl, man or woman. I want to say to you, I want to look at you and I want to tell you, that Jesus took on hell for you. He took on hell for me because he loved me so much. And he did that so that we would never have to experience it. <laughs> I, I can't, I have to, it's, it's amusing to me sometimes, but it's not. When I've tried to witness to people and tell them there's a hell, and there ain't no hell, that's all fake. You would not believe how people have come to me sometimes after I've preached in revivals and preached in church on, on these subjects and, and, and I've had people call me up and tell me that's negative preaching. I would say, praise God. I got your attention. You was listening. You know. But then I say to them, you know, Jesus don't want you to experience this. Jesus took on hell for you, taking on all of man's sins on him, its effects of sin, its pain of sin, and its death of sin was Jesus' greatest suffering. You get that? Jesus went, not only did he take on hell for you, but he took on great suffering for your life and for mine. Can I get an amen with that? Y'all get quiet on me. You know, I hope you're listening. I believe you are. And of course, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we don't have to worry about believing such things. But however, if Jesus was who he said he was, and if he did conquer death, then we must embrace everything he said. He is our Lord, and we gladly submit because of that. You know, when I look at this, and before I close in light of the future reality of hardship. 
and the ultimate salvation that Christ is offering us, we must stay ready for Christ's return at all times in love and obedience. And the Bible says he's going to reward us for it. Now, for us to understand the truth of heaven, we must also understand why that mission was so vital. The mission that Jesus had was so vital for you to be able to have heaven, for you to be able to have eternal life. Jesus was not playing some strange cosmic game when he gave his life on Calvary's cross. He was not playing some game. He was not playing when he defeated death and hell in the grave, the Bible tells us. He was not playing when he sent his Holy Spirit. All of these things were done so that every boy and girl, every man and woman would be able to receive his grace, his mercy, and his love and to experience the new birth. The new birth. See, we're planning a baptism. You see how hard it is nowadays just to get people into baptismal water? You know, most churches, when I pastor, you're going to be baptized the next week. Because I know the longer you're not baptized, the more you're going to say, well, that's not really important, you know. But it's symbolic of a new birth. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've received His grace. Be able to live forever with Him in the new heaven, the Bible says, and the new earth. All of this was done so that anyone born on planet earth would never have to endure an eternal death called the second death, a place called hell. So you have two destinations, two destinations. It's all up to you. You have an eternal home in heaven, and you have an eternal home in a place called hell. You know, when the rich man got there, the Bible tells us he was in torments. He wanted somebody to go and tell his brothers, don't you come to this place. He was thirsty. He just wanted somebody to touch his tongue with some water. I believe he's in true torments. It didn't say torment, it said torments. But the thing about it is, you know, when, when a man gets in that position, he know, you can notice what happened to the rich man is that when he got in that position, he became evangelistic. He became evangelistic. He said, I want you to go tell my brothers about this. Now, if all of that's not real, the Bible's the biggest lie that's ever been written. But I believe it from cover to cover. From cover to cover, I believe that the Bible's true. And the warnings are with us every day of our life. God is showing us every day of our life. We don't know the time. We don't know the place. We don't know the moment. But I want to tell you something. I'm going to be prepared regardless. It may not happen in my lifetime. It may not happen in some of these youth lifetime. But if it does, I've done my job. Warning you and encouraging you, praying for you, loving you to be all that God wants you to be. I want you to have what God wants you to have. I want you to have what Jesus died for in your life, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Can I get a piano player? We're going to have an invitation here in a moment. I want you to play softly just for a moment. Just for a moment. And I want you to listen. Listen to your consciousness. Listen to your heart. If you're saved and on your way to heaven, I am so glad. But if you're not saved and on your way to heaven, you can get saved. All you got to do is be obedient. The Bible says, whoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. And Christ loves you. And as we bow our heads and piano play softly for a moment, I want you to think about your destination. That destination, a place called heaven. It's so much better than anything else you've got. Young people, you need to listen to me. You need to listen to me. You pay no attention sometimes to what's being said. But 
what's being said is very important. It's not a laughing matter. It's not something to ignore. Because I've preached teenage funerals. I've preached funerals of children. I've preached funerals of old people. But all of them had a destination. My heart's prayer is that your destination will be heaven. So, Father, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed and while this invitation is being given, it's important, dear Lord, that we are obedient. Lord, I've done my best as a preacher. Lord, I believe it or I wouldn't preach it. I made that decision in my life many years ago. And money can't buy. Nothing would take that decision away from me. But, Father, this morning, there may be some that need a special divine touch from the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I give them over to you, and I pray that your will be done during this invitation. It's in your blessed name we pray, and everyone said.